Welcome to Our Highest Work, a podcast where we are gathering and sharing the best ideas for spiritually based business and life success, and where we are creating a community of wise and loving mutual help. My name is George Cow, and today's episode is audio only. The topic is about online marketing with more honesty, compassion, and spirituality. Basically, I'll be playing a talk for you that I gave on a telesummit called Living in Oneness, the Five Pillars for Success. I gave this talk at this, at this virtual conference, which included topics of spiritual growth, relationships, parenting, business, and public service leadership. Some of the speakers there included Neil Donald Walsh, Barbara Marks Hubbard, Katie Hendricks, Bruce Lipton, and others. You can check out the full summit at www.livingin1.com. That's spelled L I V I N G I N O N E.com. It was organized by a nonprofit called Humanities Team. And I'm going to play the talk for you now. And it begins with a two minute intro by John Thomas, one of the staff members of Humanities Team. Greetings, everyone. This is a warm welcome for all of you joining the call from around the world. My name is John Thomas. I'm Humanity Team Conscious Business Program Coordinator, and I'm one of the co-hosts of the Living in Oneness Five Pillars for Success Summit. Uh, today is day 10 of the summit, and we're continuing our fantastic program and lineup for you of speakers. Uh, we have over 16,000 registered participants, and the number is still climbing. Um, I know this is going to be a popular um, segment, so thanks for joining. So, as you know, the Living in Oneness Summit is all about how we can come alive, fully alive, as part of the divine. The uh, mystic poet Rumi once said, set your life on fire, seek those who can fan your flame." And if you're listening and participating in these sessions, you are one of those who's doing that. And um, we are very much here to fan your flames and to give you some practical tools and support to support your journey to living in oneness. I'm excited about today's program and um, our interview here with George Cow. We're going to explore the experience of living in oneness in our daily lives, focusing on the workplace and the work that many of us do um, as teachers, trainers, and coaches, and so forth. Um, George is a uniquely gifted and well-respected coach who works with spiritually or oriented entrepreneurs to help them succeed in marketing their business. George is all about helping people live in oneness by becoming wildly successful doing good work or right livelihood. And as you can see, if you're on uh, George's speaker page on the Living in Oneness um, Summit site, that we already have uh, lots of comments and questions that have come in. So George is a pretty popular guy, and uh, we're in for a very exciting interview. So thanks for joining this morning. Yeah, thank you, John. It's such an honor to be here. Uh, I love what the summit is up to. Um, what an important message. And I love that we are applying the ideas of oneness into uh, the various aspects of our lives so that it's really holistic living. So I'm looking forward to today's session, and uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you lead. And as, I, uh, as John mentioned before, I, I'm really, I really want to be here to serve all of you. So uh, probably the most useful way that the session can go is for you to ask your questions about how we can do virtuous marketing, how we can do business in a more conscious way. Uh, as John mentioned, my, uh, most of my experience has been serving uh, small businesses, solopreneurs, especially those who are trying to market online. So I, I welcome your questions. Uh, I know John has already come up with some really good questions that we can discuss as well. So um, I'll, I'll let you uh, lead that, John. Yeah, I'll, I'll underscore that, and um, I have a few questions, but we're definitely counting on many more from the audience. So, um, but 
To get started, like I mentioned, George, I really enjoyed our interactions. I've been inspired by your, your unique approach to coaching and your perspective on what you call compassionate marketing and virtuous marketing. And um, I was hoping we could start off with your sharing your perspectives on us. Yeah, would love to. So uh, I believe that marketing, so marketing, most people think, well, it's just something you do to get out a message. Oh, it's something you do to advertise a service or a product. That's what marketing is. And yes, that's true. Uh, and I believe that marketing is essentially about discovering our discovering and expressing our calling the calling of oneself if one is a solopreneur a, a sole proprietor it's really uh, finding and discovering um, your alignment with what the world needs and your own authentic voice uh, if it's in business of course if it's a larger business marketing is discovering the soul of that business and expressing it authentically in the world and so marketing isn't just a tactic or a group of tactics or a group of strategies. It's, it's, it's about soulful business. It's soulful um, uh, expression in the world uh, in, in terms of our, our profession, right? Now, mm-hmm. I also believe that marketing has a, has a profound effect on the moral state of the, of the people who do the marketing and even the the people who consume the marketing. Uh, What I mean is how we do our marketing, uh, how we think about our audience, shapes our our moral principles, our moral center. Uh, For example, something that I used to teach, but I have reformed. I'll call myself a reformed uh, internet marketer, reformed... Uh, sort of, uh, I used to be more aggressive and, um, well, I'll just say I used to be more mainstream of, of a marketer, you know, really just thinking about marketing in terms of numbers and in terms of, you know, manipulating the audience, uh, getting more opt-ins, getting more conversions. This, this is how so many marketers talk, right? Uh, marketers, we, we talk about, we talk about our audience as if they were objects to be manipulated, just numbers to be manipulated. Oh, how can we tweak this web page to to get more opt-ins? How can we tweak the offer to get more conversions? As if you know, as if they the, the audience were Pavlovian dogs, um, <laughs> just that we have to ring the right bell and ring it in a certain way, and then they'll they'll salivate. And and the the the, um, the sad the sad truth, uh, John, is that I used to teach this stuff. For years I taught this because that was what I was taught. You know, we tend to pr- propagate what we are taught, right, and what we grew up with. And so I had to do a lot of deep soul searching in order to come to where I am today, which is to take a stand for a much more compassionate and virtuous type of marketing. So I, um, so I guess I'll just kind of oh, give an overview here to, to say that Compassionate and virtuous marketing is about seeing our audience as who they really are, their highest selves, that they are a soul that has infinite worth. And, I mean, this is in, in, a, in opposition to what the mainstream marketing does, which is call each audience member, like, look at their lifetime customer value, right? And I've talked yeah. in that way, too, like, oh, how much is this person worth to my business? How much, you know, how much will they buy over time? And I, can, I definitely understand why businesses do that. Of course, it's, uh, I, I also have a very strong left brain. I, I, I love metrics and statistics, of course. Um, I love planning and you know, strategizing and all that stuff. But what we tend to do is we don't balance it. We don't balance that with what are we really here to do. We're really here to serve the highest self of our audience. We're really here to remind them of who they really are. And we're really here to, 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 to make our strengths serve their true needs and wants. And so uh, instead of talking about, for example, marketing to their lizard brain, I know some of you may not have heard that, but I used to teach this too, like, oh, we, yes, sure, of course, we want to lift people up in their consciousness, but let's, we really need to start with by marketing to their lizard brain, the part of the brain that, that's all about, you know, uh, fear and, and greed and sex and, you know, um, pride and, you know, all that, 
neg- the baser, not, not negative, but I should say an earlier part of our evolution. It wasn't, it's not bad or good. It's just an earlier and I would say outdated part of our evolution now. We're now going to another place. We, the lizard brain has been, you know, I mean, you could look at our own brain. It, it, the lizard brain is, is at, the, at the core of it, but then it's been uh, papered over with the, the, you know, the mammalian brain, right? And now I would say that we're even, we're even creating a new layer of the brain that is more, uh, even more spiritual, even more intuitive, uh, even more connected. And so let's, if we, if we only market to people's lizard brain thinking that, you know, the, the means justifies, or the ends justifies the means, we're going to get them into the door by doing manipulative things, by things that we don't really love to do, but we've got to get them in the door and then we'll try to lift them up to a higher place. It doesn't work that way because when we use lizard brain tactics, we ourselves, the marketers themselves, become more lizard brain because that's what we, what we focus on expands. And when we market to the audience's lizard brain, that, we are also expanding that part of their brain. We turn our audience into more fearful. We, we make them more fearful so that they'll buy our thing or we make them greedy so that they'll buy our thing and want more. And so I am taking a stand to uh, market to, to uh, we are really marketing to each other, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. as, as people who communicate with one another, we are marketing to each other and let's market to one another's higher self so that we can expand that influence in our lives. Hmm. Wow, yeah, what you're saying is so um just rings so true, George, it seems and, and you know, we look around and that what's normally passed off as marketing and so much of it is um is very manipulative as you said and does really zero in on baser impulses, you know, the lizard brain. And um, I love the way what you're inviting is that, um, it's particularly said, seeing the, um, the, our, the, our customers, seeing their highest self and aligning, making our strength uh, available to serve that, that highest good, that's really, really powerful. And um and really, you know, I think what you're, you're kind of reframing the whole discipline of marketing around just, um, our innate connection of oneness, uh, the spirit yeah. and everyone. It's really beautiful. I, um, yeah, and, you know, and I, I feel that we are, where we are all one is in our highest self, right? I mean, in this third dimensional reality, in the, we might call our lower self, our more material self, we are obviously separate. I mean, you, you know, you're in Oregon. I'm here in San Francisco. Um, I cannot, you know, physically touch you right now. But uh, I believe my, my highest, my higher self and your, your higher self, we are communing right now and we're collaborating. And that's where everybody is one. And if we market to that higher self, the higher self becomes stronger and it, the higher self will recognize uh, the uh, communication from another higher self, you know, another part of the higher self, shall we say. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Um, I um, thought I'd pull in just a couple of comments and questions here. So um, we have a uh, 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 Margaret uh, Nado and um, calling or chiming in from London. Great event, lots of insight. So thank you, Margaret. And um, a Jennifer from um, Jennifer uh, Walkerton, Ontario, Canada. Canada. I work full time in the career that I enjoy. So I'm ready to move forward. I'm a single parent as well as a grandparent to a child with autism, for which I'd like to know how I myself when time trips to treats, et cetera, to propel our soul. So that's a broad question there. I wonder if you have any any inspired wisdom. George. Yeah, thank you. Wow. Um, I feel that uh, many of the speakers here in this wonderful summit have probably spoken to that. And mm-hmm. uh, what I what I would like to focus you know this session on is yeah how do we propel our souls in in terms of uh, business and especially in terms of online marketing. And I know that we'll be continuing to to talk about that throughout the rest of the session. But thank you, Jennifer, yeah. for your for your presence. Yes, thank. And um, George, let me bring in. Uh, uh, there is a question that's more directly 
directly related to your topic. Um, so this is Donna in Longmont, Colorado. How do I decide what products to create or what my audience really wants and needs rather than what I want to make? Um, and that, uh, yeah, if there's any thoughts on that one. Yeah, well, Donna, that is a very insightful question. And I I wish that more people uh would more business owners would ask that question because that is the uh that is a very productive inquiry. And I think what I will do is that I will I will provide you a tool, Donna, then I'll provide this to everyone. Uh, maybe this is something that can be placed on the speaker page at, at some point. Uh, I've created a niche interview template uh, that you are all welcome to use. It's actually on my blog. If you just want to go to, um, I actually blog at. Well, let me let me uh, let me give you an actual link here. Um, uh, www.georgecow.com/blog. Georgecow.com/blog. And then if you go, and I have a couple of dozen blog posts now, and one of the dot blog posts is called How to Do a Niche Interview. So, Donna, that's the process that I recommend and walk through with my clients is doing that niche interview with your – you could start with your friends. Uh, start with the people that you already know uh, who might be interested in – uh, one of the strengths you have to offer. And in that niche interview template, if you are someone who's like, well, I don't even know which strengths I want to offer, at the top of the niche interview template, there is a niche decision template, which is sort of like the pre-step. And so you can use the niche decision to come to a, a, a greater clarity about what you want to um, offer the world and then use the niche interview template to make a clearer match between what your audience really wants badly enough that they would pay for it and what you are most excited to offer and most qualified to offer. So I would uh that's sort of my uh, my my short answer for now and just to check that niche template. And and it's free by the way. Um I and I should mention something unique that I'm doing um I I started doing this year is that I decided at the beginning of this year to to now make everything I create in terms of information and knowledge and modules and training, all of it is now free. Uh, and I, that's a radical decision because for the past six years, I've made a full-time living, a, a, you know, a very successful business, selling information, selling training, selling modules, selling you know, uh, do-it-yourself sort of at-home coaching programs. Made a lot of money doing that. But I just I came to the realization, uh, you know, last year, that I just got deeply impressed by the, that this idea that I am now living as if I am dying. Mm -hmm. In terms of my work, in terms of my right livelihood, uh, what if this were the final year that I have to live? Wow, now, I al beautiful. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, and I always have to clarify, in terms of my health, I, li I, I live as if I'll live a thousand years, right? So I, I take good care of the, the, the temple of the soul, the, the body. It's very important to take good care of it. But in terms of our work, we really don't know when uh, it has been divinely uh, determined that you know we, we will leave this particular life. And so if this were your last year, this is a question that I ask myself, right? If this were your final year, that you were able to do your greatest work in this life, what would you do? Mm. If this were your final year, and what what messages would you share with the world that is so important that you would share it in your final year? What problems in the world break your heart so that you that's what you would want to work on if you had one year left? What would mm. you want to leave for your friends, your family, your colleagues, your audience, your, your community? What messages would you want to leave for them? What teachings? What have you learned that's so important about life that you think should be communicated more in this world? And when I ask myself those questions, it just, oh, it, it really opened up something within me. And I said, all right, I, um, and I, like I said, this is radical. This is not something 
that I necessarily recommend everyone do. I, I think that it, it, it really took me several years to transition to this point. So if any of you are inspired by this, it, it may take you several more years, especially if you are currently you know, selling information products. Uh, I, I've just finally transitioned to this place where I'm like, I don't sell any more information products. The only thing left that I sell is my time because my time is truly scarce and it's truly limited, whereas information that I can give is infinitely scalable. I can put the information on my blog, and it doesn't matter if... And by the way, I don't even, I don't even have a blog on my own webpage. I'm, I think about everything in terms of information as is where, is where I put it infinitely scalable such that if a million people load that page, it doesn't matter to me versus one person loading that page. So I put my blog on medium.com, which is not my own site. It's, it's, a, it's a website created by the, the, the creators of Twitter. Okay, so they know what they're doing. Medium is a is a blogging platform, and I put my stuff there. So if if ten million people want to read it, great. It doesn't cost me a dime more, and Medium is happier if lots of people go there, right? So I think about how do I make my information infinitely scalable, and if it's infinitely scalable, I don't I don't want to charge for it because that's my legacy. That's what I want to leave the world with, and in terms of my videos it's all it's all online and free and available now at youtube you know so again youtube loves if more people go there and it doesn't matter it doesn't cost me anything more if lots of people go to my videos on youtube and so i put it there my my audios i put on um podcast so it's on itunes again it doesn't matter how many people listen to my podcast the more the, the merrier and um i even have mind maps uh, where I share, uh, I'm, I'm creating new and better ones every, it feels like every, every day I'm creating new and better ones. But you can also find my mind maps online if you just go to georgecow.com slash free, F-R-E-E. Uh, you, I, actually just this morning I updated that webpage with the link to all my mind maps. And so I, uh, so actually this, this is probably relevant for, um, for, for Donna who asked the question and for anyone who's thinking how do, what products do I create? I want to encourage and inspire you. Now, I just say that my model is only one model. Uh, my, I, I don't say that my model is the only way, and it's, I'm not saying it's the best way. It's the way that most, m- most brings me alive. And so use it if it brings you alive, or, or borrow any part of it and merge it with someone else's model that brings you alive and make it your own. Uh, so my model is I no longer sell information, even though I can make Lots and lots of money selling information, which I have for, for six years. I made, you know, well into the six figures a year personally after, you know, after prof, you know, the profit. Made that for six years. But then I said, no more. I want to now only sell my time. And this is ironic, right? Because most business coaches teach you, you need to go from one to one to one to many so that you can, quote unquote, leverage your expertise, leverage your time. Don't leave money on the table. All those phrases that, we get we hurt we hear i say now i'm going the opposite i am wanting to to really serve people one to one i'm i don't i i leverage my time by giving away everything for free that's able to be given for free and my time so what's interesting is that since i started doing one to one coaching which was only 5 months ago i have seen more transformation in my clients more true and lasting uh, change in them. And I have more fulfillment than I ever had before. Now that I'm giving away all my information, I find that I have even more to give than I had before. Uh, My creativity has been opened up like nothing before. uh, And I feel more peace and more fulfillment. And yes, my my peers might say, well, George, you know, you could make a lot more money. You could could times your income by five or ten. If you sold your information, I said, yeah, but I have what I need. Why do I need to make more money? If I have more fulfillment and peace and creativity, isn't that more important than making more money? <laughs> and so mm. that's what I do. I, I limit, I limit the, the domain of my life that is commercial. I consciously limit to say, I'm only going to make money in this one way. Everything else, I purposely take a stand to not make money on so that I can have a more pure and open and free sense of, of creativity and giving. And what's interesting is that people say, well, George, if you give away all information, then what do you have left to sell? Well, like I said, I sell one-to-one time. 
but um, uh, and it's it's wonderful time. It's really much more fun. <laughs> it's much more fulfilling because I see people change. But the other thing is that when we give something that's intangible, we find that there is more there to give. But if we hold back what is intangible, we create more scarcity and more fear in our lives. Now, this is as opposed to tangible items. Like, okay, obviously, if you give away, you know, money is currently in this world is still tangible, like, you know, represented as, you know, dollar bills. If you give away all your money, there's no more money left, okay? It doesn't just magically appear. If you give away all your possessions, there's no more possessions left. It doesn't magically appear. But if you give away your ideas, if you give away your love, suddenly there's much more left there to even give away. That's what I've discovered personally. I'm sorry, uh, a bit of a long answer. A, <laughs> that's a beautiful principle, what you're saying. And I, I, I know we have other questions we wanted to get to, George, but I'd kind of like to go into this a little bit further because, you know, you started out saying, talking about living as if I'm dying. And um, I think as many of us know and the listeners on this call, that is just a fantastic, powerful principle to just live by. And yet, um, I think often many people experience that in many areas of their life, but when it comes to their livelihood, that's like where, well, wait a minute, you know, i, I got to pay the bill. And yeah. that whole, um, and I, I wonder if we could, we could share, uh, you said so much here, but I, I think that that beautiful sort of leap of faith um, of stepping into the unknown where you are, I found in my life a powerful shift happened when, I stopped letting the, the guiding compass be of the money and security mm. and I shifted that compass to just what feels alive and true and how am I, how am I moved? And, um, and that has a certain going out on the plank or a leap of faith. Uh, you go into the unknown at that point because our social roadmap doesn't help us at all. Um, I, I wonder if you had any other comments to say on that. And we're getting lots of online resonance and confirmation with this whole topic, by the way. So. Oh, I'm I'm so grateful. Yeah, and I, I'm just wonderful to hear, John, that you've been through um, that kind of transformation. That's amazing. And I've also heard the story, you know, Steve Farrell's story about that too. Uh, mm-hmm. And I I know so many people on humanities team, especially the the volunteers. Uh, you know, and, and the staff have gone through a similar type of, um, yeah. from the material to the spiritual transformation. You know, um, so yeah, let me let me speak to that because I, 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 I mean, I, I I like to think of myself as a spiritual person, and so I'm I'm connected with you all, uh, definitely in that way. I also like to think myself as a very practical and pragmatic person, and I am. It's been a lifelong inquiry how to. Uh, align the two <laughs> and how to live both and, and, and live both as one. And what I've discovered is this. Um, as, I, as I was mentioning earlier, when it comes to ideas and love and prayer, uh, the more we give, the more we, we find we have to give. Right? That's the intangibles. When it comes to money, though, because we still live in a society where money is tangible, it's not yet... Um, it's not that we give it away and then suddenly we have more. It's that we give it away and we find we have no more. Uh, mm-hmm. That we do need to be uh, more third-dimensional when it comes to money. And uh, I actually um, want to give you another resource for everyone to, to check out afterwards. Uh, I have a, a whole talk uh, called Conscious Money Flow. And it's basically my best thinking on how to deal with the issue of money. Uh, and it's nine principles, and you can find it for free at um, if you just Google "conscious money flow George Cow," you'll find the complete talk. It, you can it's it's on YouTube. You could also download it as an audio if you just want to listen to the audio. That's fine because there's the YouTube video is not synced. Uh, it's so it's so funny. You know, one of the things I I just a little a little tangent here. I have found myself becoming a model for minimalistic. Marketing. <laughs> and what I mean by that is if you look at my marketing, it's very minimalistic. It's not flashy. It's not – some people would call it amateur, but they don't know, and I don't care. I mean, I don't, 
you know, people you say, well, George, they don't know that you're you're really successful and you're very credible. And I was like, you know what? They'll find out if they go into my information. If they're patient enough, if they are, if they if they want it enough, they'll go into my information and see that it's credible and it's and it works. But I'll let them find out. Um, so I I have <laughs> for years modeled that kind of minimalism. And the funny thing is, my YouTube videos are another example. They're not flashy. They're, there's no production value. <laughs> it's just me on on the on the screen talking. And there's nothing fancy at all. And in fact, my worst produced video, which is Conscious Money Flow, it my mouth and the words coming out of the sound don't match. That's how bad it is. And yet, it's my most popular video yet. So what does that tell you? That tells you that content and people you've heard this say said over and over again online content is king and i would say distribution is queen so those those who had to go hand in hand but content is king which means that if you give of your heart and if you give truly useful digestible attractive information uh build it and they will come build it and the millions will come eventually millions uh so Anyway, that's a little bit of a tangent. So in terms of my money thoughts, I could talk for an hour and a half on that, which I do. So I would just refer you all to the Conscious Money Flow uh, presentation. Just in short, I will say this. Um, treat money and your financial life uh, like it wants to be treated, which is it's, it's, it's a third-dimensional thing. It's a physical reality thing. So we do need to steward money uh, like we steward our, our own house, you know. Uh, we need to steward it. Uh, we need to be pragmatic with it, but not. But it's the, it's this balance of being pragmatic and yet not greedy and not fearful, and that's the key. It's like, all right, do I have a uh, do I have a realistic plan to earn enough money this month and for the next you know year? Do I have enough? And I encourage all of you to start saving so that you do have a, a whole year of buffer for your living expenses. So this is the kind of stuff you'll hear from Susie Orman, you know, or other people like that. So, um, but what I what I don't agree with is the people who say that you just need to make more and more money. That more money is better. No, I don't think more money is better. I think more money creates more fear, uh, more need for security. So I think we need to find out what is enough for each of us. And also, I should say that money and spiritual practice are deeply aligned. And what I mean by this is this. I believe we're being called in our spiritual practices to, well, to be more spiritual, to be less material. And what that means to me is to need less of the material, to increasingly need less of the material to be fully fulfilled and at peace and happy. Uh, you could see this in you know the, the uh, extreme example, but very memorable examples are the you know the, the gurus and uh, the gurus on the streets of India. You go to India, you see the people on the streets. Some of them are profoundly spiritual gurus. They don't they don't have a following. They don't build them you know build themselves as that, but they are profoundly at peace and fulfilled and happy. And they're at a, a, a level way beyond most of us are, which is they've truly. They've, they've transformed much of the material desires into spiritual desires, and so they need a lot less. But we are all on that path. And so the more you, for example, meditate or pray or find, find your fulfillment within community, human community, and natural community, the, the earth, the less you find you need to buy. And the less you, you need to buy, that means the less money you need. And the less money you need means the more freedom you have to do your art, to do your spiritual um, work. So that's the kind of the, the, the general path we're all going. But while we, because before we get to the path, before we get to the place of needing nothing, uh, we do need to be pragmatic and say, all right, right now I do need $5,000 a month <laughs> to be comfortable, you know, to be sure. at peace. So, yeah, that's, yeah, that's wonderful advice. And, and a lot of the principles you're pointing out is um, we've had some great talks on money during this during these um, sessions and um, factors, just thinking about Lori Hyland's message around the new money and the quantum economy and saying that money is really, really a flow of energy and, you know, hoarding it and holding it on, uh, onto it is, is just stops that flow. It's all about, um, you know, um, not being attached to it. And um, so it's great. And uh, I think well, uh, if that sounds good. Uh, many of us will look for that conscious money flow um, talk online that you, you mentioned. Um, 
Could you other, if you don't mind, there's a few like just real practical questions I see coming in. Um, there's a few want to address one of these uh, all or both. There's a Heather from Seattle. Uh, can you go deeper, a bit deeper into mind mapping? What is it? And Erica in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, how do you use YouTube for your business? Um, I know those are pretty, both pretty big topics, but anything you'd want to share in passing Absolutely. around those? Happy to, happy to. So mind mapping is simply a way to write down your ideas and, and to share your ideas. That's all. So mind mapping is basically when you, when you go, the, the software I use is called mindmeister.com. Uh, M-I-N-D-M-E-I-S-T-E-R dot com. And there's a free, there's a free plan on MindMeister. And, uh, I, I use the $5 a month plan. So, you know, even with my $5 a month plan, I do a lot. Um, and mind mapping basically is you start with an idea in the middle and then you branch off to say, all right, and, you know, uh, if I'm starting an idea with a tree, okay, tree, uh, branch off into, uh, branches. Uh, and then from the branches, uh, there's another branch called leaves. And then another branch says roots of a tree. So it's like you, you brought, you, mind mapping aims to help you th- write down your ideas like your mind thinks. Because our mind tends to think in terms of associations. This idea is associated with this idea, which is associated with that idea. So that's what mind mapping is. I love it because it helps me to organize my thoughts. And the great thing is you can collapse branches and expand branches so it it helps you to think and it also allows me to share complex ideas with the world um so check that out mindmeister.com all right uh youtube is okay a lot of people don't realize this but youtube is the second largest search engine on the internet we all know the largest search engine <laughs> google right <laughs> And a lot of us actually mistakenly think that the second largest search engine is Bing or Yahoo, but it's not. YouTube.com is where people go and search for all kinds of stuff, and that's actually bigger search engine than Bing and Yahoo combined. And so YouTube is – and also you've, you've, you've all noticed when you search something on Google, right? When you search something on Google, sometimes you see that the, the, the very, at the very top, they give you results about videos – the videos related to that topic. So I got clued into this, and I'm like, wait a second. If I don't have videos, <laughs> then when people are looking for stuff that I love talking about, they're not finding me. That's when I decided to start creating lots of YouTube videos. Um, I've now created a couple dozen. I think I'm on like, like in. I think I've created 30 or f- almost almost 40 videos now, uh, all on, on on YouTube for free. So the key about using YouTube, and I think one of the questions about that was, do you have to be an expert in videography? No, you don't. If you look at my videos, they are so unprofessional. They're so amateur. It's just me talking, but the information is valuable. And I think what's more important, I mean, yes, if you are an expert in video production, that obviously helps because, as I said before, content is king, and good content is three, has three characteristics. It's useful. It's digestible. And it's attractive. So when people say, oh, be, have good production value, have, be a good videographer, that's the attractive part. And yes, that does r- figure in to how, how well received the content will be. But I'm just basically working on the useful and digestible part. That's really what I'm working on because I, I believe that that's where I'm strongest at. And when you do YouTube mm-hmm. videos, just be sure that you are thinking about your audience what are they searching on the Internet? What questions are they looking for that you can answer? And if you put those questions, if you make little videos answering those questions. So here's an idea. Take, a do- take out a document. Write out as many questions as you can. Get to 100 questions if you can. 100 questions that your ideal audience are asking about your topic the thing you want to build a business around. What are they asking? What are they searching in Google? Write down 100 questions. Now, some of the questions may be repetitive, but it doesn't matter. Just brainstorm, write them down. Then, once you write down the questions, you can start to 
uh, prioritize, organize the questions. Well, which ones are repetitive? But sometimes even repetitive questions are really nuanced differently. And you want to create more videos rather than fewer. So it's actually better to create more shorter videos. If you had a, you know, 30 hours of time to create videos, I would rather see you create shorter and more videos than fewer longer ones because shorter videos people tend to watch. And I'll give you a particular metric for this. YouTube considers short videos to be under four minutes long. If you go to YouTube, the search engine, I mean, YouTube, you know, YouTube, everyone knows about YouTube. If you use their search engine there, you can filter by short videos, and it's under four minutes is what they call it, short. Uh, long videos are considered over 20 minutes. Uh, they have a filter for that, too. For some reason, they don't have a filter for videos between 5 and 19 minutes. I don't know why, but that's, that's the way it is. So make your videos either under 4 minutes or over 20 minutes. Is, is best to make it under 4 minutes. Even better to make it under 2 minutes if you can because mm. people are more likely to watch it under 2 minutes. So imagine you answer separate questions in little 2- to 4-minute videos about your expertise that's what people will find when they search those questions. You are like, you know, you have a better chance of being found, and people will be so grateful that uh, that their their questions are being answered. So that's what I suggest. That's really great, George. And one of the things I just wanted to say as, as I was hearing you how you you produce your YouTube videos, I think there's a beautiful principle there, and that you know you don't um, get stuck in in perfectionism, which I think this yeah. is where many of us stop our flow yeah. and our creativity. Well, it's got to be just perfect, and so I won't put it out there. And yeah. I think the lesson, what's inspiring the way you do this, is you you really don't get caught up in that. You're really more focused on what's the juice, the truth that needs to get out. And um, and, I, and your videos are not bad, by the way, so, <laughs> just so people Thank can you. appreciate You're very kind. that. Yeah, no, I think they're they're... they're more than good enough for what you are, I mean, you quickly, you're not distracted by the video quality. You get into the message. I think that's the thing that's so beautiful about what you're doing. Um, I really wanted to, um, you know, George, it, it's a question um, I think many people are interested in. And in fact, a couple of comments online, I'm seeing the same thing. Um, you know, it's a, a little bit about you and how you got to the, the life you live. And, I mean, I clearly see you as um, one of, as a person who embodies the whole spirit of the theme of the summit of living in oneness. And I'm curious to ask you how how did this awakening to oneness happen in your life? What what in your experiences were turning points, or what inspired you to move in this direction in terms of what you do for a living? Mm. Oh, thank you for that what, that beautiful question. So uh, be- before I get into that, I just w- want to say a bit about the perfectionism thing. Mm-hmm. Um, absolutely. I- I ha- I'm a recovering perfectionist. <laughs> I used to be so scared <laughs> of putting anything out there uh, unless it was uh, perfect in my mind because I was scared of people saying bad things. And I was people's- scared of rejection. And I realized after some time of being exhausted of trying to create something perfect that, oh, my gosh, there's – it's almost impossible to create something perfect. And so I just put it out there. And what's interesting is once I put it out there, I started getting positive feedback. And you will all discover this too. If you put out there what's truly in your heart, you will get more positive feedback than negative feedback. And the positive feedback will bolster you to say, oh, it's okay for me to step out in my messy hair and imperfect, you know, uh, outfit or whatever it is, you know, in, in perfect way of speaking. <laughs> mm-hmm. you just listen to this talk. How many ums and ahs and backtracks have I done? It's very imperfect. So, um, but I share with my heart, <laughs> and I think you all can sense that. So what I would say is this. There is a, there is a good place to be per- perfectionistic, which is try to be perfectionistic in your heart and in your spirit. Uh, strive to come from the purest heart you can. That's where we should be perfect. But in our tangible manifestation of ourselves, that's where we can be totally messy <laughs> because people will sense your heart. And if you come from the, uh, a, a pure heart, people will feel that and they'll sense that and they'll, they'll reward you for that. Now, regarding the video, I also have to say this. I've, I've just 
earlier recommended that you all do short videos, two to four minutes long. I wish someone recommended that to me when I started doing videos because I had started doing really, really long ones, and I got used to doing really, really long ones. So I, just in terms of my time management, I've already dedicated to my audience that I will do two episodes per week for an entire year. So it really takes all my working time to do that, and my episodes are like 30 to 60 minutes long. So I haven't yet had time to do short ones, but I'm telling you now, once I, once this spell of doing episodes is over, I'm going to start working on doing short videos. So while you are not yet committed to doing super long videos, start with shorter ones. Okay. So, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> don't, don't, don't go down the path that I went down. Go straight to the shorter ones. Yeah, just go, go yeah. leapfrog over, over what I had to do and just go straight to shorter ones, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so, hmm. my, um, uh, so your question about so how I got to this feeling of oneness, I feel that each of us has a different journey there. So mine is going to be unique, I think, to what everyone is, of course, but maybe you'll get some inspiration from mine, too. So one day about four, five years ago, I saw something on social media, on Facebook, and that started to change my life. And I say this because I want to emphasize how important for all of you to continually share what is most the highest truth for you. Share continually the highest truth for you because all of us need reminders. Human beings are easily led astray. I am easily led astray. I need you all to keep sharing on your Facebook, Twitter, wherever you share the highest, most beautiful truths that you can find. Because it's not... People say, well, I don't want to share on social media because it's, I don't want to add to the overwhelm and it's already too much information. Well, so much of the information on social media does not lead us to higher places. That does not remind us of higher truths. So you need to take that place. Okay. Um, let's drown out the, 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 the lesser truths with, our, with, our, with the highest ones that we, we are aware of. So I saw something on social media that led me to this movie called uh, Nosso Lar. It's uh, a Brazilian movie that uh, was very, fa- very famous in Brazil. It was the highest uh, expense movie of, of all time in Brazil up to that point. It was a couple years ago, the movie came out. And then that movie led me to the book from which it was made. And the book in English is called The Astral City. And I actually, uh, there's a link that I want to give you to get the book for free because the book has been published online in its English translation for free. And you can find it at tinyurl.com, T-I-N-Y-U-R-L.com, slash Astral City PDF, A-S-T-R-A-L-C-I-T-Y PDF, tinyurl.com, slash Astral City PDF. Okay. That book started to change my life and my spiritual life. And um, that book was written by a man named Chico Xavier, X-A-V-I-E-R. He is a Brazil- he was uh, a Brazilian medium who channeled more than 400 books in his lifetime while working full-time as a humble government worker. And this guy's incredible. So he was works during the day, and at night, he would do two things. At night and weekends, he would do two things. He would help tra- – um, he would write letters from dead people, from loved ones who had passed on for, for his neighbors and friends. And eventually, people came from all around the world lining up uh, every weekend to get the letters from their, from their loved ones that passed on. And his writing – his channeling was so convincing, so, I guess, accurate. Uh, his writing would – his handwriting would be different for every letter. Uh, and, and it would say things that he would possibly not know. And he did, he did this for thousands, tens of thousands of people. And then when people went away and went home, he would channel writings from the spirits. Over 400 books in his lifetime. Anyway, this was his most popular book. So I've just given you the link to that. And that book led me to the school of thought called Spiritism, which started in France, became popular in Brazil, and uh, the uh, the works of the main works of Spiritism are all online for free. Uh, it's by Alan Kardec, K A R K A R D E C, Alan A L L A N, uh, Alan Kardec. Uh, his five main books are all online for free. This, the first one that I started with was called the Spirits Book. 
But anyway, long story short, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't call myself any particular religion. I just got a lot of encouragement from, from this stuff. This stuff made my faith so strong. Uh, it, mm. it, it, um, I, I, I no longer doubt in the existence of an afterlife. I no longer doubt that you and I continue on forever. Uh, and that this is just one of probably hundreds or thousands of lifetimes we live. This is a blip in the a blink of an eye in our existence. And we are here to help each other. Remember that. We're here to help each other live the most courageous, uh, the most humble, the most loving, the most uh, you know, faithful lives we can. And um, I, I'll share, I, I will share uh, two, more, two more books with you. One is called um, the Afterlife Experi- the Afterlife Experiments, I believe it's what it's called. It's by Gary Schwartz, S C H W A R T Z. I think it's called the Afterlife Experiments. A very well written book, very exciting book uh, about scientific experiments into mediumship. That really convinced me. Oh my God, there's more than this physical world. I have never experienced myself anything paranormal. I've never seen a ghost, <laughs> never seen a UFO, mm. never, you know, nothing. But because of this reading, I believe. And the other book uh, that really helped me was called um, The Afterlife Unveiled. The Afterlife Unveiled by Stafford Betty, B-E-T-T-Y. Stafford is his first name. Anyway, these, all these books made my faith so strong that I, it's, I, you know what I should say is, it doesn't take a lot of courage for me to, to do what seems crazy to the mainstream world, to live as if I'm dying and to give everything away uh, in terms of ideas and information. It's not, it doesn't take that much courage. Once you have faith, it, it, it's just a little small step towards, all right, let's experiment with a, a magnanimous life and see what happens. And uh, thankfully, when we experiment with giving our love for free, um, our knowledge for free, we find that people respond with gratitude and with reciprocity because mm. their highest self is saying, yes, we are connected. You know? Wow. Beautiful. Thanks so much for sharing that. It's so um, delightful to see, you know, across all the presenters here and living in one of how many different um, yes. paths have people have taken to come to the same fundamental truths and realizations. And um, I know we're quickly getting to the top of the hour, and I'll have to shave a little time for the wrap-up. Um, I, I did want to share with you and for everyone a few beautiful comments coming in. Um, uh, this is Angela um, shared. Uh, I've always thought the same thing, that information we have is not ours to sell because it is truly original. It was given to us by source. We, what we receive should be given freely, freely given the situation uh, shouldn't be how we are in a living night right now, not right now especially. So thank you, Angela, and um, beautiful comment there. And another one I'll share here, um, this is from Clarissa um, in Maryland. Um, I'm following, I am, if I'm following George, this can be distilled into the intent behind the golden rule. Um, oh, it would be yeah. nice if everyone would take that intent seriously. And I think we would agree with that. Um, and uh, one just quick thank you to, to I love this comment uh, from Jane uh, Lau, who says, my favorite thing about living in one of the seminar is that I'm listening to it deep in the mountains of South Ecuador. Transformation oh. is global. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, George, this has been really, truly fantastic, and I didn't touch but um, a small sample of all the questions that were flooding in and comments. This was, um, you know, I just uh, can't say enough uh, for your wisdom and your insights and your just big heart. Um, And just I think you mentioned it before, but just real quickly, if people want to find out more about you, what's the best way to do that? Your, Your website again. Yeah, thank you, John. It's uh, www.georgekao, uh, georgekao. dot com, uh, and all of my <laughs> what is what I've been saying over this interview, all of my knowledge and information is now available for free there. 
uh, and I welcome you to benefit from it. I would love to hear from any of you who uh, have questions. I, um, you know, I, I, I do have good work-life balance, so I can't always get back to you very quickly, but please feel free to send me your questions or send me any success stories or any uh, well, encouragement. I, I love that, too, so feel, feel free to be in touch. If you enjoyed that talk, I welcome you to share it forward and help others. If you'd like to ask any questions or make any comments, go to www.ourhighestwork.com slash 29. If you are currently on the YouTube page, you can simply comment below. So until the next episode, keep your thoughts positive, keep your heart open. Be well.